My name is uh, Marisa Gomez. I'm the public programs manager at the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. And I'm really excited to be here with you all tonight um, for us to talk about one of our region's most influential, revered and beloved naturalists, Randy Morgan. I'm also joined tonight, let me pull them up, um, by our presenters, the museum's uh, collections manager, Kathleen Aston and the director of the Kenneth S. Norris Center for Natural History, Chris Lay. Hello, you two, thank you for being here. Um, and I'm gonna be handing it over to you two in just a moment, but I did have a couple other things I wanted to get out of the way. First of all, I would like to share a poll with everyone. So let's see how this goes. I'm gonna launch it. Um, we are sure that um, many of you like me um, never had the chance to meet Randy Morgan, um, but are admirers of his work. But I'm also sure that there are people joining us tonight who loved him and knew him. And um, we're grateful to have you join us and would love to hear your thoughts and memories in the chat throughout the night um, as well. So uh, please take a moment to just fill out that poll. And I'm gonna share my screen again and just get through a little bit of housekeeping, if you don't mind. So. Um, I want to note that this program, one moment. Da, da, da. Um, I want to note that this uh, program is in partnership with the Norris Center and the San Lorenzo Valley Museum in support of their new exhibit, Look, Act, Inspire, which is a virtual and public exhibition celebrating the work of many past and present local naturalists, including Randy Morgan. Um, and I'm sure Chris will have more to say about that later. Another little housekeeping measure is to note that your video and your mic are disabled for this webinar. So we are gonna be communicating via the chat and um, we'd love it if you could take a moment to switch who you send your messages to from the default, which is to panelists and choose the option for panelists and attendees. That way everyone joining us can see your questions, see your stories, see your memories and chat with each other. Um, so we'd love for you to practice using the chat and switching it to also sending it to attendees by um, answering this question in honor of the plant lover who we will be talking about tonight and share what is your favorite plant native to the Santa Cruz area. Um, can't wait to read your answers. And we also want to acknowledge that the land on which the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History resides, as well as the Kenneth S. Norris Center of Natural History is the traditional and unceded territory of the Yupi tribe of the Awaswas Nation. Today, these lands are stewarded by the Amamutsan tribal band who are working hard to fulfill their obligation to create or to care for and steward Mother Earth and all living things through the learning efforts and the Amamutsan land trust. And members of the land trust are featured here in this image. And I'm now going to stop sharing my screen and bring back in Chris and Kathleen. And let's launch the poll, share the results. So this is pretty cool. We've got kind of um, a split and most of the people joining us tonight actually knew Randy, which is, which I think is awesome. Um, and I uh, can't hear, wait to hear uh, the stories from Chris who also knew Randy. And again, if you um, have anything to share throughout the night, um, whether it's a question for Chris or Kathleen or a memory, please feel free to use the chat to do so. And let's see what these favorite plants are coming through. Uh, just one, <laughs> yeah. I agree, Sarah. Claytonia, uh, silverleaf manzanita, Sibsianothus, Monterey cypress, naked buckwheat, Calicordus albus. Oh, I love the Calicordus. Okay, we're gonna be talking about plants today um, and lots of other fun things. So I'm going to now hand it over to Kathleen who is gonna get us started. Hey everybody, um, excited to do this today. It's been a little while since I've been involved in one of our virtual events, but I know we've been having a lot of fun stuff happening. Um, so let me just share my screen. Um, cool. So I am going to get started today talking a little bit about Randy Morgan's life um, and kind of his naturalist journey, some biographical details, um, and looking at some interesting ways they parallel his involvement with our museum, Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. Um, I never had the pleasure of knowing uh, Randy personally, but all like all members of the Santa Cruz community, I benefit from his profound impact just on the actual physical landscapes um, that still exist here because of his conservation work, but also all of the people who he like so warmly shared his knowledge with um, 
and who he shared his collections with. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started. And I'm and I'm really excited to be a lot of times from this um, event, we do sort of looking at things from a collections perspective, um, the close up events that I'm usually involved in. Um, and I think it's really interesting to look at stories of people like Randy, who are like behind these Herculean achievements with things like collections that have thousands of specimens in them. And then as we explore their lives, we get to sort of peel back those layers and see all the different, you know, people um, and events that like made that whole thing possible. Um, so that's what I'm going to look at a little bit. We're going to pass it over to Chris and he's going to dig a little bit more into um, the Randy Morgan initiative uh, at the Norris Center and what's happening with Randy's collections today. Um, and I bear with me on this. I recently learned from a professional ornithologist that birdie is the way the technical term for describing a situation where there's going to be a lot of birds. Um, and so this is my first time using it in a professional setting. Um, so Randy's Morgan life, Morgan's life really uh, had a birdie beginning. Um, so we can see here pictures of him as a young child. Um, tiny and also small with his father and the farm that he grew up in, um, in the Soquel area, or that he grew up on in the Soquel area. Um, he was born in 1947. Um, he grew up wandering this landscape um, with his parents and three brothers. Um, from a young age, he was very interested in birds and some of the earliest words that he ever said were something along the lines of what bird is that? Um, this photograph is from 1952, around the same age that Randy fell sick with rheumatic fever and was bedridden for an entire year and spent a lot of that time looking at the natural world out the window. And this um, just only served to inspire him further to be interested in the natural world and to be getting back out there and to learn a lot about it. Um, and so, and his interest, you know, was very um, aesthetic, but also really visceral embodied interest. He didn't shy away from the gross or tragic elements of nature, as you can see from this quote here about how every time a dead bird would come my way, I would think it's too beautiful and interesting to let it rot. Um, and in the oral history that I believe this quote was from, conducted by Frank Perry, you can hear him, Randy, just being sort of excited and starting to laugh as he mentions this quote. So. Um, from early on, he was interested in salvaging the silver lining of the death of these animals and would um, help prepare the taxiderm or, and taxiderm the ducks that his father and family friends would go hunting for. Um, and uh, he even describes actually witnessing the electrocution of a pair of Orioles as a child as something that he found to be very sad, but also just inspired his interest in preserving birds that he was encountering. Um, and so, of course, his interest in birds brought him to the Santa Cruz Bird Club as a youth, where he became a household name and helped complete the version, the first version of the bird file, um, which probably a lot of you are familiar with, which is a compilation of the earliest local bird sighting data um, from this area. Um, and so, as all of these interests uh, were, you know, building, he had a lot of support from his family. His father was not a taxidermist, um, but he was resourceful and he supported Randy's ornithology interests by helping him learn the arts of taxidermy. Um, so these are some pages from the Northwestern School of Taxidermy catalog from the late 1930s. So they were a little bit too early for what would have been in use in Randy's childhood, but you can see that taxidermy was something of a burgeoning hobby um, at that time. Maybe this is how his father had encountered some information about the process. Um, and these ads are wild and um, very interesting and advertise a lot of aspects of taxidermy that have to do with like art or financial gain. Um, so we're lucky and like you can see down here in the corner that um, I think on one side that there's some specimens that are like woodchucks are hitched up as if they're like cattle. Um, so we're lucky that Randy was interested in uh, naturalistic displays of specimens and understanding their anatomical features. Like he speaks a lot about how interested he was in like the trachea and vocal systems of ducks, um, rather than just these fantastical perspectives, um, because for him, the promise of inco income that these ads have definitely paid off. Um, so under the direction of Dr. Glenn Bratt, who we can see um, holding part of the newspaper, the older gentleman um, in this article about the Natural History Museum breaking its uh, natural breaking ground for its natural sciences wing in 1962. Um, that was the same year that this our the museum's then director, Glenn Bratt, hired Randy to be a taxidermist um, for various mounted specimens that would then go on display. Um, and this was a period of time in the, when the museum was sort of shifting between like uh, having displays of more like mounted heads and things like this and, and transitioning to more naturalistic displays. Um, 
And this must have been uh, like a fun engagement for Randy, who also used the money to help pursue um, his college degree in linguistics. But it also must have been fun because uh, he cited the like encountering displays of taxidermy specimens at SoCal Elementary School as inspiration for his own naturalist journey. Um, and here he was then crafting specimens that would do the same for other people. Um, he would go on to become, among many other things, uh, a Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History Research Associate, a position he would later describe as being among his major achievements. Um, and I do, we're just looking at some, like a small portion of the specimens that we have that were made by Randy Morgan in the, between about 1962 and uh, 1970. Um, and I do want to acknowledge that these photographs of these specimens, as well as the introductory photograph on my first slide were taken by our intern, Brian Johnson, um, who is a Norris Center student and a 2019 Webster Fellow here at the museum. And he focused on inventorying, condition reporting, and cleaning our historic taxidermy specimens. Um, and these photographs here are from the guide that Brian created to the work that he had done into working with historic uh, taxidermy specimen collections. Um, and he, you know, the museum ecosystem has its own interesting sets of observations to be had. And while he made this guide, he was noting and, and included some information about, you know, the interesting oil residues that seemed to potentially be a holdover from the, you know, bodies of ducks while they were living, building up on their feet over the decades, or um, the possibility that one specimen, that not a Randy specimen, but a, a local specimen was stuffed with uh, redwood shavings, which would be a very interesting, like hyper local example of like what is useful to stuff taxidermy specimens with. Um, so uh, Brian's work on our specimens in storage has been invaluable um, at, as an asset from a collections management perspective and enables us to share things like Randy's collections and presentations like today's. Um, but uh, we also, you know, have specimens of Randy's that are hallmarks of our exhibit halls upstairs, um, where they continue to captivate audiences and get people excited about our animal neighbors. And so this exhibit piece here on the left of the screen was a highlight um, from a collaborative exhibit between our museum and the Norris Center in 2012 called Keen Eyes and Curious Minds, um, made by Frank Perry, who, and it was about exploring the lives and work of local naturalists Daniel, Daniel Miller and uh, Randy Morgan. Um, and I really love this exhibit. This exhibit is beloved by a lot of members on staff. Marisa has a lot of great thoughts on it. We can ask her to share at the end uh, if we have time. Um, but I think that displaying the tools of taxidermy like this um, really helps to demystify the way that we are representing animals and makes at least one aspect of like a nature museum world more accessible to our audiences, uh, which I think is pretty cool. So taxidermy birds in particular have been a big hit at our uh, annual Museum of the Macabre Halloween celebrations, which we really hope to revisit uh, in the near future. Um, whether it's putting a display of uh, Randy's ducks on display for um, showing the diversity of birds um, along the top of that shelf uh, in the top picture, a little bit hard to see, sorry about that. Um, or collaborating with Norris Center taxidermy students to have live taxidermy demonstrations. Um, and so again, this preservation of once living animals for study and display, it might seem a little bit macabre, but it's really an opportunity to connect to audiences with like weird and wonderful and creepy and crawly things in a way that's really popular um, and that we really enjoy doing. Uh, so, not only are we the proud stewards of these display specimens, we are also uh, store collections from the second major naturalist turn in Randy's life, uh, which was plants. Um, one of Randy's mentors, uh, Wild Bill Anderson, um, with whom Randy did a lot of birding, quote, rubbed his nose in plants until it caught in about the early 70s. Um, and his then consuming passion for plants, which uh, started around that time would lead to the development of his collections, which are currently at the North Center of more than 5,000 specimens, um, collected across 35 years. Um, and in the words of the Randall Morgan Initiative website, uh, form the basis of our understanding of the current botanical diversity within the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, so the scope of that is incredible. And while doing that, he still found time to stop by things like uh, the 1978 Museum's Wildflower Show, share his knowledge, talk plants with people. Um, also, a lot of the information, uh, the biographical details um, in this my part of the presentation are pulled from the Randall Morgan Initiative website. Um, so if any of you guys are interested not only in exploring more about his collections, but also about his life, um, there's a lot of great resources there. Um, 
So as a real quick diversion, most of our Morgan specimens are intended for uh, display because most of them are these taxidermy specimens that he was hired to make for exhibits and such. We do have a small collection of grasses that Randy collected. Um, and this is just a quick plug for a selection of specimens, not Randy's, um, but just some other highlights of our, our humble herbarium that are currently on display for the Art of Nature exhibit, um, which allows us to present an interesting comparison between what we learn um, for from you know, herbarium specimens and botanical drawings and how we can compare and contrast those. So you should check it out if you would like to stop by um, now that we're open again. And we also have the Art of Nature virtual exhibit, which is really neat and has actually more exhibit pieces than um, the in-person version. Um, so I just wanna scoot over a little bit back to Randy Morgan. Um, so now we're looking at two of the about 78 grass specimens that we have in our collections. They were collected in 1972 and 1973. Um, and about half of them are native California specimens like this salt grass on the left and about half are non-natives like this Italian ryegrass on the right. Um, these are the original labels. So please pardon any scientific names that need updating. I meant to do that to my slides and I forgot until just now. Um, so I can't imagine that we have any fans of Italian ryegrass in the audience, not big ones anyway. Um, but I do think it's interesting that this collection, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the highlights in a moment, but it includes several instances of Italian ryegrass, um, including you know, some just sets of various um, variations in the flower structures that Randy was finding. Um, and so given his like renowned attentiveness to diversity, um, even within the species construct and his passion for discovering new species, which he did a lot of, I'm, I've wondered when looking at these grasses, what brought him to make these collection choices, given that he was primarily passionate about native flora and fauna. Um, so that's just like one quick plug. And then we're gonna move on to that native flora and fauna. We're gonna look at a couple specimens um, like this Pacific wild rye. Um, and so you can see uh, that this is from me, Onion River Point. Um, and uh, these herbarium specimens are, uh, again, they're from the early collecting years. Um, and it seems that a lot of what Randy was doing was, was gathering specimens and then preparing them. And then um, they, a lot of them got transferred to the Norris Center where um, they would then be updated. And this is across various, um, both plant and insect collections. But that is all to say that these are non-standard herbarium sheets. Um, and so they're a little bit smaller than what you might normally see, but you do see critical labels that provide interesting identifying information, information about the collector, the collection site, and the date, um, which is really important for any valuable botanical specimen. Um, you see like in this uh, Dune bluegrass, you're seeing um, a lot of like important structures like the roots of the plants, um, in this uh, California bottle brush, you're seeing information about how the whole grass specimen wasn't able to be captured on a single page. Um, and so it was cut down and the notes were made about its height. Um, you can also see that the floral structures um, were like highlighted and separated. Um, and you see, you know, again, like different sort of pieces of the plant all displayed so that a researcher who was using this might be able to learn as much as possible from just a preserved specimen. Um, and then one thing that you might also notice while you're looking at this particular plant, so there's a wide geographic range um, in these various specimens. Uh, primarily, they were collected in Santa Cruz County, but also in Marin, Solano, and Merced counties. But you'll notice that this one um, is from the Soquel area. Um, and I just wanted to bring us back to this other picture of the uh, Morgan farm. Oh, it looks like I'm not... Uh, Huh. My screen did a little bit of a weird thing, but I think you guys can still see. Um, yes, me... it looks okay. good. No. Thank you, Marisa. Trying to make sure I'm better about sharing my screen the right way, y'all. Um, but I thought it was interesting to bring back this. It's a different view of the um, farm where Randy spent his childhood um, to think about how these grasses, so about 38 or so of them were collected from the SoCal area in this collection. Not, We don't have a lot of more specific information than that. Um, but they're definitely like a snapshot in time of, the ecos of an ecosystem in Santa Cruz County. And this is especially important as the composition of native California grasslands has been um, overwhelmingly reduced by development, invasion of exotic species, human related activities. Um, and this landscape, uh, you know, SoCal, especially this area, this specific farm where Randy grew up was really of critical importance to his naturalist journey 
because when he was young, his family had to sell this farm and watching bulldozers develop or, you know, rip through these fields for development um, made a huge impact and was one of the beginnings of his conversion to a conservationist. Um, so Randy was a founding member of the local chapter of the Native Santa Cruz Native Plant Society. Um, he would champion conservation of various areas throughout the county from, you know, Sand Hills to Wilder to Poganip um, and elsewhere. And I'm sure a lot of members in the audience are aware of this. Um, and Chris will talk a little bit more about it, but it is interesting to note that his work, um, you know, thinking about plants and conservation and his work in the early 1970s doing environmental surveys in response to requirements created by the Endangered Species Act uh, led him to the conclusion, um, the observation that animals seem to have more charisma than plants when it comes to saving spaces. Um, and this conclusion led to another turn of his interest, which was towards insects. Um, and so Chris is going to talk more about the insect collection, which resides at the Norris Center. Um, and I had this slide put together just to talk a little bit about Pat Smith, um, the incredible, uh, you know, Museum Associ Association board member, volunteer, uh, leader extraordinaire, who is always just like uh, doing an incredible amount of work, printing posters um, and running events for the museum and other community organizations. And she also um, helped Randy create, uh, she was an early computer user um, and helped Randy create, you know, tons of labels for his insect specimens. I was going to talk a little bit more about that actually, but um, because, and, and just thinking about how important it is that people who are doing things like this, creating enormous collections, um, uh, helping other people label those are really doing these things out of like love and offering their time to like build up resources that are valuable for the community for decades to come. Um, and I was going to talk a little bit more about that. I already have, but I wanted to um, share actually Randy talking about Pat in his own words, something we're able to do because um, Pat Smith's daughter, Laura, shared with us a great video of him uh, just before this presentation. And so my final uh, slide is going to share that perspective. Uh, I, I sort of do a lot of na different natural history kind of things around here and uh, you know, birds and plants and then one, for 10 years in a row I did insects. I tried to document the insects of Santa Cruz County and uh, I've collected like 100,000 specimens or so and um, I needed labels, very tiny labels with the, with the location data on them uh, and the date collector and um, the, you know, the things were to be identified later, but they had to have this basic data on them. So so uh, Pat was good with a computer, and she um, spent so many hours with me um, uh, trying to get these things small enough, first of all, and making just label after label. There was, like I said, there was like 100,000, but a lot of them were, 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 were copied. They were, um, you know, reproduced, uh, duplicated the same location. But anyway, I told her she spent so much time, it was so... Uh, you know, so uh, meticulous work, and so she did so much for me that I, I said, okay, if I find an undescribed, an undiscovered new kind of insect in this county, I'll name it after you. And lo and behold, like a year later, I found this. Uh, it's called a tiger beetle. It's a um, gorgeous, sparkling green and purple and bronze thing, predatory beetle that runs around on the ground in the grasslands, and it hadn't been named. I checked it out with all the other tiger beetles at the Academy of Sciences and so forth, and and um, so I thought, aha, here's here's Pat's beetle. This is going to be the Patricia beetle. So so uh, we were getting ready to publish this thing, um, name it, and get it, you know, published in the literature. And and um, the guy that was uh, collaborating with me, um, named Dave Cavanaugh, he said, well. Cisandella is the name of the genus. That uh, has to be part of the name. It has to be Cisandella. So, so the other part of the name, the species name, was going to be Patricia after Pat. So, uh, but he said, well, maybe just be sure. We better check in the catalog and make sure there's not already a tiger beetle called Patricia. Incredibly, there was already one. I, I couldn't believe it. There was already a Cisandella Patricia. So, okay, I so, thought, oh well, we'll we'll do Cisandella Smithii. That'll that'll be good too, because then Kirk and Pat can share it. And he looked it up, and there was already a Cisandella Smith. 
so I, I had a friend here, uh, John Lane, who um, uh, who suggested a really good name, uh, Cisadella Olonii, because it's in the same area where the Olonis were, and they probably used them for jewelry or something. They're so pretty, and and um, so it got to be named Cisadella Olonii. But to me, you know, it's always Cisadella. It's always the Patricia Beagle. You know, whenever I see it, I, I think of Pat and all the work she did for me. So. Um, and I, someone commented on how great a video it is, and I do really, the thing that's great about this video for someone like me who didn't know Randy is that it really brings him to life in full color. Um, I especially like where at the beginning of the video, he sort of refers to himself who, as a person who kind of, you know, does some natural history things around town. Um, and so uh, that's sort of the um, end of my portion of the presentation, and now we're going to tag in someone who did know uh, Randy Morgan personally and can talk more about the person and the legacy. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to hand it off to you. Thanks, Kathleen. Uh, what a fun video to see, and it's a great uh, transition point to talking about Randy um, and his relationship to the Norris Center and my relationship to him. And while that video was playing, like I had to go and I grabbed his hat. He gave me his hat right before he died. Um, uh, but it's so fun to hear his voice. So let me share my screen here and um, we'll keep going here. So can everyone see that? Is that working? Looks good. Yeah, looks good. Okay. So like Kathleen said, I I got to know Randy or R, and I will probably call him R or and Randy interchangeably. He liked to be called R. Um, and uh, I wanted to share some stories that I remember uh, from working with him. Um, and I also have a few quotes from some other people that, that knew him in different parts of his life. I knew him in the latter part of his life. Um, and mostly we spent time up here. I'm at the Norris Center now at, up at the university. Um, and he would come in and we would discuss things about his collections and what we were gonna do about his collections and how we were gonna work on his collections um, and learning to read all his handwriting from thousands of pages of notes. Um, and trying to find support to do work on his collections and apply for grants. And we made exhibits uh, to show off his work. Um, uh, but I just wanna start just with this quote, and this is a quote from a close friend, Robert Stevens, um, who many of you may know. Uh, but just to give you a little bit of a sense of his personality, he, he really, he just didn't care about the material world um, and was just focused on being out in nature and trying to understand it and getting out there as much as he could and really focusing on Santa Cruz County. Um, for large portions of his life, he just stayed in the county and practically crawled across it, um, doing plant surveys, insect surveys, all kinds of things all over the place. And, we have hundreds, maybe thousands of those surveys as part of his work up here. Um, just another quote that I wanted to read, I didn't put it here, but uh, this is a quote from Christian Schwartz, who I think I saw in the list of participants. He was so quiet and self-effacing, but wickedly sharp and funny. He would sometimes catch me off guard with a zinger when I said something of dubious intellectual merit. I definitely remember that part of him too. So I just wanted to share probably my earliest memory of working with, with Randy was uh, in 2009. I, when I got here, he was one of the first persons, people I met. He was so concerned about his collections. He wanted to meet the new person. And he showed up in, with my, in my office with Jim Belsey, the greenhouse manager, and just Jim was facilitated the introduction and immediately I knew um, that, you know, Randy was an important person and I needed to get to know him. And I soon figured out that it was his pollinator collection, his insect collection that was really 
what needed to be focused on. He'd done a lot with plants. He'd done a lot with birds and people knew him as an, as a bird person and a, and a plant person, but they didn't really know him as also this incredible resource for insects. And so I convinced him to make a presentation at the California Native Plant Society meeting in 2009. And I was so worried that he was going to just clam up and not, you know, just not be himself and not, and not you know, just be comfortable in front of the group because he was, he was shy, he was very shy. Um, and so, but I knew like, we gotta get up, Randy, we gotta tell people about this collection. Nobody knows about this amazing resource you have. Um, and so we titled the, the presentation, Meet the Pollinators of Santa Cruz County Plants. Um, and I remember at the Arboretum on the whiteboard, somebody wrote our, the title of our talk and then they wrote Randall Morgan and Chris Lay right below that. Um, and, in the at the beginning of our talk, Randy started off the talk by saying something like, well, let's get right to it. Chris and I have a busy schedule ahead of us pollinating all the flowers of Santa Cruz. Uh, and from then on, he just hammed it up the entire time uh, at our presentation. Um, and I was just so pleased that um, he just he just ate it up and yeah, we just had a great time making that presentation. So that's a really fun memory. So what do we have? Um, and I just I, I, I just wanted to show this screen and I'm, I maybe won't talk about every single thing here, but uh, over his entire life as a naturalist in this county, um, he really accumulated an immense amount of uh, writings, collections, surveys, um, and through the work of not just him, but like an army of other people, um, we have managed to uh, curate them and store them and even make them very available to the world, really. Um, you heard a little bit about his plants. Um, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about his insect specimens, 72,000 insect specimens, um, mostly pollinators and uh, mostly with individual plant association data. Um, and, uh, and in that collection, well, I'll talk about it in a little bit more as we get there, uh, but also published and unpublished field data, uh, the beginnings of new plant species descriptions, a whole monograph on a section of the clover genus, the trifolium genus, um, and an immense amount of things that I'm still going through. We have two file cabinets of papers that I haven't even gone through yet. Um, so it's really an incredible amount of resources. It's gonna keep me busy for a long, long time. I wanna tell you a little bit more about his, his insect collection um, briefly uh, and, and what we've been doing with it up here. Um, uh, Cause it's, it's really been my mission over the last 10 years to like publicize what he did here. Cause this is really an, an amazing resource. Well, he, he, he chose out 39 sites in the county to go uh, sample insects from. Um, and he didn't just sample insects, you know, a day or two. He went over an entire year and he'd go every three weeks and he'd head out um, and he'd walk a consistent transect and he would collect things off plants and label them um, what plant he was collecting them from. And then he'd come back three weeks later and then three weeks later. And in some cases, he would go to these sites over multiple years. And what he did he would go out and collect things. He'd put them in a film canister. That's a film canister for those of you under 30. Um, uh, uh, we used to have actual film that we'd put in canisters, but he'd put insects in the film canister and he'd usually drop a little leaf or branch from a plant, or sometimes he'd put in a label of what plant he collected it from. And he, you know, sometimes he'd get home with hundreds of these film canisters and then he'd throw them in the freezer. And then later he would pin them out in a particular order. 
And then he would write out what he had found um, and he'd ID them as best he could right at the right then and there, and he'd write them in his catalogs. Um, and he did that over 11 years. And as a result, his catalogs look like that box down there in the, in the, in the bottom, like uh, just thousands of pieces of paper um, that's in addition to 72,000 specimens, all individually labeled a lot by Pat Smith. But I will say there were a bunch of other people who did labeling, myself included. Um, uh, and just a tremendous diversity of things, many of which have plant association data. Um, and I, <laughs> like, I remember um, working with him many times and, and just going through his collections, like, 72,000 specimens, 150 plus drawers, like thousands of pages of catalogs. And you could imagine that in all of that, there might be some mistakes or some things that we couldn't figure out and resolve. And so oftentimes when I would meet Randy, I would have to interrogate him and said, Randy, what did you do here? Why, why is this labeled so weird? Like, I don't understand your numbering system. Um, and I recall one time sitting with him, like I'd pulled out the hard things that I couldn't answer um, based on all the things he had done. And at one point he kind of just threw up his arms and he says, man alive, I can't believe I had so much energy to go out and do this over 11 years. And I kind of just like paused for a second and I looked at Randy and I said, Randy, I've thought that many, many times as I've been going through your collection. I'm glad that you actually had that thought too. Wow, how did someone have the energy to do this? Going out like five to six days a week and coming back and pinning out hundreds of insects and writing them out. Um, uh, writing them in his catalog. Uh, it, it just was, it's just an astonishing amount of work. Uh, but a lot has come out of it. And we're excited that we've got this amazing, amazing resource of rare species, undescribed species, uh, endangered species, um, you know, like the Ohlone tiger beetle in the bottom right there. Um, uh, and really amazing uh, representation of communities of insects found in habitats all over Santa Cruz County. Um, and it just makes this amazing broad record of what the pollinator communities were like in the 1990s when he did this collection. So what have we done? Uh, I just wanted to share some of the things that we have done with his collection and with his help in some cases, but in a lot of cases, it's been with the help of undergraduates and graduate students. And one of the first things that we, well, I wouldn't say it's the first things. One of the things that took the longest time and is still taking time to do is that we finished labeling his specimens and we finished sorting his specimens as best we could. Uh, and then we took his specimen data and we digitized it, which just means to type it into a database. So not only are all the data about when it was collected, where it was collected, who collected it, what plant it was collected on, what species it was, not only are, is that on the label of every single of the 72,000 specimens, we've now digitized and databased over 30,000 of those specimens and entered them into uh, an, a, a, an online database that you can access. So you can see, and we even took photographs of his specimens and you can access, you can do queries. You can ask, you know, where did he find uh, Bombus flavifrons in the county, which is a particular type of bumblebee that I bet most of you haven't seen in the county, but it's here, um, or at least it was. Um, so we did that digitizing and 
that was with the help of many, many undergraduates. Um, and it was also with the help of finding funding. And it took us many, many years to finally get a grant to do this work. And that was a really, that was a good day when I was able to tell Randy we got that grant. We've done a lot of research uh, based on all this, all this information that Randy collected. So we, we really are able to relate insect abundance uh, to plant association information. Um, we know, for instance, where uh, we found some of the bumblebees, what plants we found them on. We know when the females came out in a, at a particular time or when the males came out at a particular time. Um, and we can, we can separate that out by species or lump them all together like we did here with the genus Bombus, which, is, which are all the bumblebees. Um, in Santa Cruz County. And this was the result of undergraduates working on this. And we also have had several graduate students do part of their PhD work studying the pollinator communities here in Santa Cruz. We've gone beyond what Randy did himself. Randy really focused on, uh, you know, when he had his collection, he got interested in the bees and he sought out bee taxonomists and he got interested in the Lepidoptera, the, the, uh, the butterflies and the moths. Um, and he sought out uh, experts to help him with this. But there were other groups that were important pollinators that he didn't really dig into. And we've dug into them since. And one of those groups are actually flies, a group called the surfids, the hoverflies. And we've gone through and identified an immense amount of the, of the 3,000 surfids that are in, this, in the collection. And it actually turns out that one of those species within the surfidae is actually the most, it's actually uh, been collected the most. We have more specimens of a species in the genus Aristolus than any other potential pollinator. Um, so even though flies may not be uh, efficient at transferring pollen, their numbers are greater than things like bees and they probably make up for that lack of efficiency in number. And as a result, they're pretty effective pollinators and we haven't really studied them as a scientific community very much. And so we've gone through and really dug into that we even had an undergraduate um, produce uh, a local identification guide for common hoverflies in Santa Cruz County. And that's on our website. And we just keep going. We've got more plans. Um, and we're excited that this, starting this spring and summer, we're going to start resurveying some of his sites and set up some long-term pollination monitoring uh, that we'll just keep going back to and trying to repeat what Randy did. And we're super excited to be partnering with two organizations, um, the Camino program at UCSC and the Doris Duke Conservation Scholars Program, which support uh, underrepresented um, minority groups that don't, you know, that are they're underrepresented in field biology. And we went through and we, we spent the last year raising uh, a whole bunch of money to support, we're going to support four students um, and have a research team that's going to start this resurvey and long-term poll pollinator monitoring this summer. And we're super excited uh, to do that. This thing over on the right is a picture that in one of our students who wrote a biography of Randy um, uh, drew to represent the change in the in the pollinator community in the Sandhills from then and now. Um, and it, it corresponds to some research that one of our graduate students did. So I had to I had to go talk about his insect collection. Um, that's been my mission is to really like work on that. But of course, he was a botanist and plants were really his first love. Um, and uh, a big unfinished project is his, is his Clover Manifesto. Um, and he published some new species of clovers 
And we went through and really took as much information as he had produced and put it on our website. And um, it's there ready for a better botanist than me to take it on and um, look into naming more clovers within the subsection of clovers that are found in California. Um, and many of, many of these species are in need of naming because they're rare uh, in, in small populations and need to be recognized and protected. Uh, I'll just briefly say here that Randy was pulled into activism um, and there, there are a number of stories, but um, he wrote letters, attended meetings, made public talks. Um, and even though he was so shy, he, he still dragged himself in and, and did it. Um, and because he'd made so many plant surveys and done so much work and crawled across the county and was such a um, a knowledge resource, he really played a role in, so, I mean, it's just like what Lori Kaguchi here, who's a friend and, and was a member of the CNPS back when, back in the early days with Randy, um, he really played a role in every significant habitat protection and preservation effort that's, that's really gone on here in Santa Cruz County in some way. Um, this picture here on the left is another, uh, artist um, drawing that uh, Michelle Pasteur, who wrote his bi biography, which is on our website, um, but also did some artwork that we, the two of us worked together to create this piece that tries to like encapsulate, you know, what his conservation legacy meant. And what you're looking at is a stack of papers that he wrote to the boards of supervisors and groups to, to advocate for protecting open spaces. And the little cutout is a silhouette of him. And you can see some of those open spaces that he played such a critical role in helping protect. And of course, many of you know that one of the land trusts of Santa Cruz County's open space preserves is named after him. So I'll wrap this up and I wanna give a chance for questions. I know I'm going on here. Um, uh, so I told you there's a couple file drawers of things that we haven't gone through yet. And I was going through it like a few months ago and I came across, you, can, you can't really see this, but this is a manila folder with like probably 60 or 70 pieces of handwritten paper in it. Um, and it's titled The Stroller's Guide to the Trees of Santa Cruz. When I saw that, I was like, ooh, that sounds interesting. Um, and I pulled it out and I started going through it. And it's just a street by street description of all the, the trees that Randy found interesting in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, and it's incredible how much information is in there. Um, and uh, he, of course, never finished it, but there's a lot of information in here. And I read through it and I ran across one tree that he spoke highly of, and it was a walnut. Um, and I wanted to know whether it was still there. And so I went looking for it, um, actually this morning. Uh, and I, was, I didn't know whether we'd find it. You know, I was worried that maybe we wouldn't find it. Um, but I did find it. Uh, and I want to read to you this quote, which is kind of an intense quote, but I want to read it to you anyway. Um, this is what he wrote about this tree back in 2002. He said, yesterday they struck again, the imbecile moron bleep cut 40 years off another of my favorite trees, a tree I have admired almost daily for years, a wonderful black walnut off Emmeline Street. The carnage is piled beside the road. No one is around to explain, to justify, apologize. Depression, grief, guilt. Could I have done something? Can I do something now? It all seems so hopeless. This decline into uglies, ugliness, barbarism. Am I the only one who gives a bleep? <laughs> is it all up to me to fix it? 
so much of my interactions with Randy was like this. And um, another amazing naturalist in our midst, Dylan Neubauer spoke of this, I remember at his memorial. Randy was just able to see this level of diversity and nuance and pay attention to so many things that so few of us pay attention to. Um, and when they got damaged or they were lost or destroyed, he felt it way more than most of us. But I would suggest that all of us here at this talk are people who feel the loss. Um, and maybe it's just a per one tree or, you know, maybe it's, you know, one preserve or, you know, or maybe it's something more worldly, bigger. Um, we all feel that loss and we all care so much. Um, and I'm not here to tell Randy this, but I want to answer his, the, his question at the end and say, no, Randy, you're not the only person who gives a bleep. You inspired a lot of people to give a bleep. Um, and it's not all up to you to fix it. There's a community of naturalists that are here in this county. Um, and, oops. And it just so happens we made an exhibit about the community of naturalists here in Santa Cruz. Um, and Marisa mentioned it at the beginning and I just wanna call everybody's attention to it that um, we decided that we would over this last year really focus on the broad community of naturalists in Santa Cruz County and make an exhibit that celebrates that community that cares um, about even individual walnut trees, um, but about so much else. And uh, again, I wanted to end with a quote um, and invite, well, actually, before I say this quote, I wanna invite you to this exhibit. It is open at the San Lorenzo Valley Museum. Um, you can reserve spots to go by your, with your own pod, Thursdays and Saturdays, Fridays and Sundays, it has public hours. You can look at our website, Santa Cruz County Naturalists.ucsc.edu to find out more about how you can go visit. But I really, really encourage you to go visit. It's, it's called Look, Act, Inspire. And Randy is just one of the many naturalists that are in our midst um, that work to communicate about the natural world, to get out there and look and make sure um, we take actions to protect the natural world and inspire the next generation. So I just wanna end with a quote, and this is from another great naturalist who was inspired by Randy. This is Ken Kelman who might be here as well. Um, but I just wanted to end with this. When I first accepted Randy had a terminal illness in December, I went to the hospital to thank him for all he had taught me in typical fashion, he dismissed my thanks for his time and energy, saying that I had done all the work. I left feeling that I had not expressed myself clearly enough so that he would understand how much I appreciated all he had taught me. For years, I have counted others as mentors, teachers who knew more than me. But it is clear that my thanks to these people must take a new form. The words are not enough. It is our turn to mentor young people, to pass on not only the knowledge we have absorbed over the years, but also the passion for the majesty of our natural history. Thanks, Ken, you, you couldn't have said it, I couldn't have said it better. Um, and that's really what this exhibit is about, is inspiring the next generation and um, uh, celebrating the community of naturalists and um, one that Randy deeply influenced. So I'll stop there and uh, I'll just say, if you wanna see more of his collections, we have a whole website called the Randall Morgan Initiative um, and go check it out. There's, we put lots of his writings on the website, just like reams and reams of his writings, if you're interested to, to hear more of his words. Um, and you'll, we'll keep putting more 
information and research projects as we work on them. So thanks everybody. Thank you, Chris. Um, gosh, that last quote from him just gave me the chills. Um, and we, we do have some time for questions. Um, if anyone uh, has any wants to put them in the chat, we also have the ability to allow people to speak. Um, so I know I've really loved hearing um, Chris's memories and stories. And um, if anyone joining here tonight, I know as we learned earlier on, um, most of you knew Randy. Um, and so if anyone would like to, to share a memory, you can just press the raise hand button and um, that will signal that you would like to be, um, have the ability to be unmuted and I can allow you to talk. So um, give that a go if you like. And um, as someone wrote, um, Sarah wrote, oh wait, no, not Sarah. Um, Kari, um, when you were talking about the insect abundance of the um, seraphids and how um, prescient Randy was uh, to be fo so focused on insect abundance and plant associations and phenology. And it really um, does seem like that's one of the big uh, conservation items of the day. And we're so lucky to have his baseline data. And I was really excited to hear you say, Chris, that you guys are gonna launch a project to add to our understanding of that. I was wondering if, if you just have anything more to share about that, or if there has been any um, additions to the insect collection at the Norris Center um, since he last added to it? Uh, we've added a few things, but um, like we, we had one graduate student um, follow up and do some resurveys to um, help augment her own research. And um, we have her, so she went back and resurveyed some of the sites that Randy surveyed. So we have her collections here and she's, um, her name's Angie, Angie Oshbacher and um, she's still in the process of publishing her data and we're excited to have, you know, to get that published and add that to the list of things that we've got. Um, but we, yeah, we have, uh, it, we have more specimens collected and more, we have more understanding of how the pollinator communities have changed. Um, in short, they've become simpler. <laughs> There's not quite as much diversity in a lot of the pollinator communities. If, you, if you're just looking at bees, she didn't look at flies and lepidoptera, moths and butterflies, but um, within the bees, like the communities have gotten simpler. Hmm. Um, let's see, Pat also just shared, Randy and John Stanley worked with me on the county's first coastal plan in 1979. Their inputs helped to preserve many habitats in the coastal zone. Um, and I know there are some other memories in here too. Kathleen, do you have anything to add? Yes, I wanted to say, um, I know, Chris, when we were planning for this talk, you talked a little bit about the different kinds of parts of like Randy's life and knowing him you wanted to share, um, uh, including thinking about different quotes. And I really appreciate that you included that quote that talked about like despair and frustration and disappointment. I think it's like really important to see how like these people who become heroes through all the work that they've done and all the knowledge they share also had like personal struggles with like the very real like emotional aspects of uh, caring about the natural world when so much of it is uh, changing uh, in negative ways. So I'm glad that you chose to share something that showed that aspect of his life. Yeah, you, if you read more of his quotes on, on the, the Randall Morgan Initiative website, he was, yeah, he was, yeah, there's more, there's more things like that. <laughs> um, yeah, he was very distraught, but also just, um, hopeful and energetic and um, yeah, he wrote beautifully about California wide about California natural history. Um, someone also asked if we could share the video um, of Randy speaking at Pat's memorial and it is available online 
And I will be following up with an email with links to the Randy Morgan uh, initiative. And um, I can also include that link as well and links for how to visit the, um, the exhibit uh, with the Nora Center and the San Lorenzo Valley Museum, some other resources too. Um, will asks, did Randy have a collection of photographs of these various habitats? His naturalist eye on the landscape might make for an interesting exhibit piece. Uh, that's Will Spangler. Will, you just you just enrolled yourself in coming up here and, and digitizing all his slides. Yeah, just a couple thousand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they do exist, but they are not quite accessible at this point. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like there's there's a lot that exists there um, and lots more to learn, but you need more volunteers. Perhaps. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll keep working through it. Yeah. No, he's got some beautiful photographs. Yeah, they're all old, old slides. Um, uh, and yeah, some of them are, are wonderful, so. Yeah, I, um, we've been talking a lot about um, collecting information from the fire, from the CZU Lightning Complex and what types of information to focus on collecting. And we've been talking a lot about um, old images of landscapes of, you know, years past pre-fire um, being, being so interesting. I'm sure that he's probably got a lot within his collection. Um, who knows the meaning that can be added to all of the, the things that he spent so much time um, collecting. And David also asks about the, the stroller's guide to the trees. I'm guessing that that also requires a volunteer. <laughs> yeah, that needs some work too. <laughs> this is what it looks like so far. <laughs> Um, uh, I, I'm very excited to, to see that done. Perhaps I will volunteer to help you with that one because I would like to have that guide. I've wanted one for a very long time. Let's see what else we got going on in here. I saw we, some, oh, go ahead. Did we follow up on Lisa's question about the concept of simpler? No, I was gonna respond to that. So what, yeah, what does it mean to be simpler? Um, so like back in the nineties in some of the sand hills, um, uh, communities like the pollinator, the, the, the main pollinator communities. The, and so you, you could think of like, maybe there was 10 to 15 bee species that were like visiting, you know, 80 to 90% of the plants. Um, uh, that ten, those 10 to 15 are now more like five to seven or something that are visiting 80% of those plants. Um, and there's some overlap with the, with, so there's some of the same species in that new group, but then there's some different species. Um, so it not only has it gotten simpler, but it's shifted, which is interesting. Um, and, you know, we, we should go out, we want to go out and, and test that and see what it's like in other places as well. I mean, a, a lot has changed in, 25 years now since he collected at some of these places. So yeah. Yeah, that'll be interesting. I'm I'm curious about his like his particular obsessions, like the clovers that you mentioned. Do you have any sense, like why clovers? What was it about clovers that struck him so? Oh dear. Um I don't, somebody else out here, I'm sure Dylan knows the answer to this better than I do. Um, she writes, uh, they are cute. <laughs> and also, um, and like uh, listening to the oral history that Frank Perry did of uh, Randy Morgan for preparing the Keen Eyes and Curious Minds exhibit, he talks, I think, I don't think this is a full answer, but Randy talks about um, just noticing that there was lots of stuff going on in clovers and people weren't paying a lot of attention to clovers because they were sort of an inconspicuous plant and being captivated by the notion that there was more going on there than was being represented. Yes, I think he saw exactly that. And then he, he, he loved discovering things. And that's what drives a lot of naturalists is just finding like, new forms and new diversity. So um, the clovers were, there was a lot, there are a lot of interesting, you know, small populations of clovers that look a little different here and look a little different there. And um, I think it just 
captivated him. Um, and if anyone's interested, we the, the Clover part of the Randall Morgan Initiative website is password protected. Um, just I was curious about that. We just wanted to like, if, if, if the right botanist comes along to like pick up on the work, we don't want to, we don't want someone else to have scooped all that information from them so that, you know, they can really pursue something without someone else swooping in and describing species first or something like that. Um, yeah, I see Adam says, keep it secret, keep it safe. <laughs> <laughs> and is yeah. that, um, do you, is that the only area of the collection that's like that or can you not, are the other secrets more secret? Uh, yeah, the, yeah. I mean, yeah. We we haven't published. I mean, honestly, there's probably other interesting things in the insect collection. Like there's that we know there's undescribed species and other really rare things that might, if somebody worked on it, might also be worthy of listing as threatened or something. Um, which is really what dr part of what drove him to study insects was to try to find rare species that he could get protection for so that he could protect the plants that um, was, were in that same place that that insect was at. Um, he was successful. He was successful with <laughs> the tiger beetle. Which, so, yeah, that makes it, do, how many um, of his tiger beetles do you have in your collection? Are there only like a few or do, are there just droves of tiger beetles that he collected? No, 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 no. We might have like 50. Um, and yeah, we, we got to be careful with them because obviously we don't want to go out and collect anymore. Yeah. Well, we couldn't, right? It's, it's illegal. Um, but it does raise an interesting question. Like every time, every so often someone comes in and I'll explain that this is a rare endangered beetle and someone will say, well, why did you kill so many of them? Um, and it's a really good question. And we had to, we had to do that in order to know that it was rare and its own species and where it was found and document it and describe it. Um, so yeah, that's, a, that's, that's part of the function of natural history museums, like broadly over many hundreds of years is museums hold the, uh, the original specimens that species descriptions were written. So. And there's also, there's protocol set up for a reason too, like that, um, that Randy went through um, working with the Nora Center for a lot of his collections and getting certain permissions and making, so it's not just that, you know, all of us interested in um, this tiger beetle are going out and collecting, you know, it for ourselves. Um, it's one of the reasons why we have institutions yes. um, like both of ours. Um, Let's see, there's another comment here. Um, does anyone have any thoughts on his uh, perspectives on restoration ecology um, or his, um, his critiques? So um, what landscape architects and nurseries do to maybe res restore um, a location? Well, I imagine other people are going to be more knowledge. I mean, I'm just looking at the crowd out here and I don't want to misspeak. <laughs> um, but I will say something. I, I remember Gray Hayes saying, uh, I don't know whether Gray's out there, but um, Gray was very influenced by Randy um, in his PhD work when Randy just kept going out and saying, look, cattle grazing actually can help native plants. Um, and he just kept saying, look, I've been observing this for decades and Gray took him seriously and did his PhD on that and really was able to, to scientifically like back that up. Um, and now there's a lot more, uh, grazing regimes or just grazing programs on, in lots of grasslands all over, you know, the peninsula. Um, not just here in Santa Cruz County, but further afield. Yeah, I know the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County implements grazing as a management um, technique as well. 
Yeah, and I see, I see Dylan writing. He was a big promoter of bulldozing. Um, yeah, you know, he had this garden at his house, which was in the middle of town, in like off Market Street, and he would he would just scrape the dirt away and and in places in that yard, he would take me around and he would show me like, oh yeah, this popped up. Like I didn't plant it here. Um, and it was, you know, some native plant that, you know, hasn't been seen around that area for decades, maybe longer. Um, That's wild. I want yeah. a garden like that. Well, yeah. and I love that. Yeah. Cause it just doesn't occur. I think to most people, you just think that like once development occurs, then, it's a, it's like a lost cause. Um, but I, that also just sounds very in keeping with his mentality from what I've learned about him today to, you know, just see what happens and watch closely and, um, and learn from that rather than maybe, you know, trying to control it. Oh, <laughs> Lisa, um, just shared that, um, he once told her that he never stayed on the path that Nima meadow because it compacted the earth too much for everyone to walk in the same place um, <laughs> which I don't know how how you feel about um promoting that Chris <laughs> but but well yeah I don't know whether I yeah no I comment mean, for now <laughs> yeah. but I do have another question for the audience actually um this is something that Chris and I talked about, and I think I asked Laura Smith about, but um, does anyone know the name of Randy's pet bird, like the cockatoo or cockatiel that was like on his shoulder in like so many like iconic photographs? I couldn't find a reference to that anywhere. Seemed like um, such an animal lover. Yeah, and so I'm assuming that that bird, for especially for someone who like just was very into birds from a very young age, had quite a story. So if anyone thinks of it, email me, I'm intrigued. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and I love, you know, one thing I learned about him through this process is just, yeah, his, his background in taxidermy and, and how he got started with, with being interested in birds and like the things that we associate him with now, um, these, these early loves are so interesting. And, um, and I just, yeah, I love that he put himself through school doing taxidermy and his badger is my absolute favorite, um, piece of taxidermy that we have in our museum. And I love that whole display so much. I get so much joy every time I see it. <laughs> Briefly, I'll just say like one of them, I think one of the moments when I realized like Randy trusted me was when he, he came in one day and he just had this box and he's like, Chris, I, I want to show you something. I want to give you something. And he had a box of duck tracheas that he'd pulled out of ducks, you know, he, he had friends that were hunters and so hunters would give him the ducks. And he was fascinated by the architecture of ducks trachea because that's how they make the different sounds. Um, and you could even blow in a freshly pulled out trachea and they make different sounds. <laughs> he pulled them out and pinned them out and um, they were beautiful. Unfortunately, they didn't, they didn't last, but- Oh no! Yeah, it was really hard to preserve them, but- uh, yeah, that was that was a moment where I was like, okay, Randy and I are we're getting someplace. <laughs> oh. I was well, trying to look for pictures of duck trachea for this presentation. And then I was like, is that too much? I don't know. But I'm <laughs> very struck by his like very specific articulations of how interested he was in that. They're really you, cool. Whenever you question if is it too much, the answer is no. Go for it. Um, but we have reached like 715. So I think we should probably wrap it up. And so I just want to um, thank everyone for, for joining us. Um, and thank you, Chris. And thank you, Kathleen, for, um, for your presentations tonight. I want to um, also share that uh, this is a collections close-up event, which is something that the Museum of Natural History puts on um, bi-monthly now. And they're hosted by Kathleen and um, deep dives into our collections. And normally it's a member perk, but we've opened it up for everyone um, in sponsorship of the exhibit, Look, Act, Inspire, um, which again, I'll send out a link um, for, for being able to explore both the virtual exhibit and the in-person exhibit. And our museum, the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History also just uh, reopened to members and will open to the general public this weekend. Um, and so you can visit uh, Randy's taxidermy there and his badger. Um, 
at the museum. And also um, I will be sharing a recording of this presentation once I get it up and edited as well for those of you who um, had to join late because I sent the wrong link to some people. So I apologize for that, um, but I'm glad that you all made it in. And uh, I think with that, we'll call it a night. And thanks everybody. Yeah, thanks everybody. Bye.